The self-regulating market, why government intervention is harmful. If only supply and demand, how long will the free market were allowed to work? However, no. People have to trust the wisdom of the planners over market mechanisms that are too complex for anyone human to understand and utilize. Market mechanisms such as the profit loss system and prices are essential for the modern economy. The rational allocation of resources to their most productive uses and to incentivize or de incentivize certain economic behavior, such as the production and exchange of goods and services. In this video, I will explain why government regulations and price controls are not only unnecessary, but also harmful on the basis of the self regulating market. The process of the free market is a very complex one facilitated by billions of decisions taken on the part of sovereign individuals who pursue their own self-interests. One change in this process can lead to many outcomes including desirable benefits and damaging consequences. Nothing in life is free. Everything has a cost. Human energy and the use of scarce resources. Everything in life that is created for the use of humans, consumer goods, requires human energy exerted, labor. Scarce goods used to create other goods, owned by individuals who either first appropriated or produced them and also created via human labor and other scarce resources, capital, and the physical space that we are on, also exclusively owned by first appropriation, land. Costs are determined by how much of these specific scarce goods or assets are needed to create something. The more of these scarce resources, capital, land, and labor are needed, the higher its costs. However, objective costs are only one part of what determines market prices, the other part being value, how intensely individuals want to receive something, how much they are willing to give up to receive it. Value is, of course, entirely subjective. Different people may want the same thing more or less, and people may also want entirely different things compared to others. Subjective value applies to all scarce resources or assets, including labor, goods, and land. In addition, prices can only be formed on a specific commodity. Historically, gold and silver, in the modern times fiat currency, are chosen to be a medium of exchange and are accepted so by people. A medium of exchange is defined as an intermediary system or instrument or system used to facilitate the sale, purchase, or trade of scarce goods or assets between parties. Prices are formed because products have costs needed to produce them, are valued by specific individuals if no one would value a product, meaning they would not want to give up anything to receive this product, no matter the costs, the price will be zero and thus the price will not even exist. And finally, prices have to be reflected through, sc through scalable units of a commodity in the form of a medium of exchange. Market prices based on a scalable medium of exchange are also needed for the efficient use, allocation of resources, and to calculate costs and expenses. Prices based off supply and demand like profits and losses incentivize or de-incentivize certain economic behavior. When a product is in high supply and has a low demand, the price of it is low and this de incentivizes people to buy the product, thus increasing demand for the product and for it to be replaced with new products. If there is a low supply and high demand, the price of it is high to de-incentivize people from purchasing it and reduces demand for the product. The system of market prices ensures that surpluses and shortages will be at a minimum due to constantly changing prices which reflect supply and demand. Demand and the subjective preferences of consumers is what drives production and individuals creating or providing goods and services in the market, the producers. Depending on what an individual is creating or producing, how much it costs to produce, and how much other individuals value the product, that determines the producer's profits or losses. This is the market mechanism of profits and losses. Profits are gained through supplying the demands of the consumers, and this is done through the efficient use of resources, reducing prices to increase demand, increasing quality, and generally better serving the consumers. Losses are incurred if an individual produces or creates something that is not valued or not wanted among the consumers, has a cost that is too high for its utilities or qualities, or the production process is simply too expensive to be profitable. 
The mechanism of profits and losses, along with competition, encourages better supplying the needs and wants of the public, meaning, to inno meaning innovating to create better products at lower costs, and individuals that cannot do this have losses. However, the state, with an agenda to, survive, to ensure its survival and expansion, always attempts to establish fair rules to play the game, meaning regulations on the market. These regulations, at best, are pointless, and at worst can be very damaging to an economy for its development and growth. One example of a pointless regulation, how the free market is self-regulating, is an example about food sanitation. There are many government regulations about food and sanitation, and what kind of food people can sell or not. Most of the supporters of government claim that people without enforcing Without the enforcement of government regulations, will sell things without considerations for people's well-being, including engaging in unethical business activities. However, this can be disproved by going back to the mechanism of profits and losses. Let's take the example of a restaurant owner who is a crazy man with no sense and puts dead rats in his soup. At first, he might get a few people who eat the soup and get food poisoning. However, this would still happen with the regulations given that enforcing them is a somewhat difficult process. After this would happen, if there were regulations, his business would be investigated and forcibly shut down. However, what would happen in a free market without government intervention? Very simply, no one would buy from his business, he would incur losses, and due to being a failed investment, he would sh eventually shut down his business. Once the news would spread that a restaurant has this kind of food, people would not buy anything from there, revenue generator would be zero, and the expenses needed to maintain the restaurant would exceed the non-existent revenue. The owner would have losses. Either he cannot pay the expenses and thus shuts down the business, or it simply becomes an unnecessary expense that no one wishes to pay for. Common sense regulations, as stated by some people who only support certain types of regulations, are not common sense at all. They need to be enforced and the money needs to be confiscated from the productive members of society to pay for the enforcement of these regulations, which is completely pointless. The role is already fulfilled by the self-regulating market, the system of profits and losses. Unethical activities that harm the consumer rather than supplying their wants will not result in profit. It will result in huge losses. No consumer wants to be scammed, wants to get food poisoning at a restaurant, or wants to die in a car crash. These activities are discouraged, not because of government regulations, but because these kinds of business activities are not profitable. However, these are only one type of regulation, and there are other substantially more harmful regulations. One example being regulations that create barriers of entry into entering certain lines of production, either directly or indirectly. These include regulations that require people to get government approval or a permit to provide certain goods, services, or just to buy or engage in certain activities. Contrary to popular myth, monopolies are not created due to a lack of state intervention in the economy. They are created because of state intervention in the economy and a lack of entrepreneurial freedom. All attempts to form cartels or monopolies in the late 1800s and to cut prices and raise profits all failed because of competition. People, instead of buying the more expensive product, will buy the cheaper product created by the competition and since the industry was free, no one could force people to accept the cartel. The cartels all failed because of people simply choosing to buy their competition's cheaper, better product compared to the cartel's more expensive and inferior product, no matter what they were providing, either zinc, oil, or railroads. The cartels, because no one would buy their product compared to the competition, would have losses and eventually break up. The individuals who created the best, most innovative, highest quality, and cheapest products were awarded because they supplied, they supplied the demands of the consumers, and thus made profit. This was compared to the cartels who cut production and raised prices, clearly not when consumers wanted and thus had losses. Government regulations were not created to help consumers, as people will tell you. The only way to help consumers is to give them full supremacy in all economic affairs. They were created for the cartels to exist and eliminate their competition, while giving the state more power. Monopolies can only be created by government regulations either directly or indirectly. A government-granted monopoly is when government grants exclusive privilege or a private to a private individual or firm to be the sole provider of a good 
or service. Potential competitors are excluded from the market by law, regulation, or other mechanisms of government enforcement. Monopolies are also indirectly created by government, such as establishing barriers of entry into the market and bailing out corporations that fail because of poor management or the inability to supply the demands of the consumers. Antitrust laws are another waste of taxpayer money used to attempt to solve an issue that the government created, the breakup of government-created monopolies. Antitrust laws would not be necessary if the government never intervened in the economy in the first place. This is compared to a free capitalist economy in which no individual is permitted to prohibit anyone else from using his property in order to enter any line of production he wishes and compete against whom whoever he pleases. Competition would always exist as, if no one would stop people from competing, there will be private actors incentivized by the possibility of making profit. Price controls, just like regulations, are pushed to help the people despite causing issues that would not occur in the free market. Supply and demand, and thus the price of products, are always changing. Prices are determined by millions of decisions taken on the part of sovereign individuals that determine inputs, which lead to outputs, market prices. One change to the production process or the final price may be very destructive for economic calculation and the objective analysis of cost. There are only two forms of price controls, price floors and price ceilings. Price floors are when the price of something has a legal minimum and cannot be priced below this minimum. Price floors artificially increase the price of something above its market equilibrium, thus create supply which exceeds the demand. Excess supply, this results in surpluses. Price ceilings, on the other hand, are when the price of something has a legal maximum and cannot be priced above this maximum. Price ceilings artificially reduce the price of something below its market equilibrium and thus creates excess demand. This results in shortages. An example of a price floor is a minimum wage, the minimum legal payment someone can pay an individual in a job. Minimum wage due to artificially increasing the price of labor reduces demand among employers and thus creates supply which is higher than the demand. A surplus in the labor market is created, which is unemployment. A minimum wage does not help the working poor by increasing their wages. It simply prices lower paid jobs out of the market, making more working poor unemployed and not allowing teenagers to get sufficient experience. In addition to that, not only does minimum wage cause unemployment among the people it claims to help the working poor, it also increases prices. Minimum wage does not increase the purchasing power of individuals, as it is merely a government price control. The only way to increase purchasing power or wealth is to produce more goods and services, which makes them have a greater supply and thus have a lower price, increase wages via increased worker production by supplying them with better capital equipment, investment towards successful enterprises, efficiency improvements, and deferred consumption or savings. Essentially, the way to increase the wealth of a society is for individuals to engage with lower time preference behavior. However, minimum wage simply artificially increases the price of labor and thus also increases the prices of goods and services. If expenses needed to maintain a business activity increases, in this case labor, revenue must be increased to pay off the increased expenses, which require increasing the price of the goods or services that the company is selling. Other businesses that cannot increase prices because of possibly reducing demand for their product, resulting in less revenue and the inability for them to pay their workers the artificially increased price for their labor, and thus lays off people resulting in even more unemployment. Even the workers who manage to keep their jobs, they get more income only then to pay proportionally more in goods and services. Their purchasing power is an increase. Costs are merely shifted and the supply and demand of the labor market is disrupted. Now, let's look at the consequences of price ceilings. Price ceilings are usually implemented after some sort of calamity that causes high prices, such as a natural disaster. This is meant to keep prices fair. What does fair mean? It really doesn't mean anything. The only fair price is the price determined through supply and demand. However, price ceilings cause more issues during a catastrophic event than that of the free market. In a free market, after this event occurs, supply will be reduced because the production process has been disrupted, and demand for essential goods such as water, canned food, flashlights, first aid, and batteries will increase. 
the price of these items will massively increase in response to the increased demand and low supply. And this will actually prevent hoarding, given that prices are very high but will eventually fall to their pre-disaster levels. After that, suppliers will use the increased revenue generated by the higher price to supply more of these goods, and the ones that don't and hoard will not make a profit and will instead have losses, another incentive created by the profit loss system. Demand will also eventually be reduced because of the high price. People are de-incentivized to buy more than they need. After demand is reduced and supply is increased, the price will fall back to the pre-disaster levels, likely after the calamity is over. However, with a price ceiling implemented or an anti-price gouging legislation passed, which is basically the same thing, the price is not allowed to rise to reflect the low supply and high initial demand. This creates a problem. The price remains that, or close to, pre-disaster levels, but the market has changed substantially. Suppliers will not have the incentive nor the means to supply their product more, given that they can't earn more for doing so in this situation than in a normal market. Demand will also not be reduced, as the price is never increased. Demand increases, the supply cannot reach the demand, this creates excess demand and thus a shortage. Now, if people could buy goods at five times the price, most people cannot buy them at all anymore after the anti-price gouging legislation is signed into law. Supply cannot be substantially increased, remaining low. Demand will also remain high, and these types of shortages can go on for months. Price ceilings during either a natural or economic calamity only exacerbate the situation and make shortages occur and for far longer than just having a temporary price increase. Another example of price ceilings, price ceilings are rent controls. Rent controls or a rent ceiling are essentially when a local government sets a maximum amount of rent a landlord is allowed to charge a tenant. This results in increased demand for these rent-controlled apartments, thus reducing their supply and creating shortages just as other price ceilings. However, rent controls are even worse than just that. Rent controls or rent ceilings only apply to specific rentals in specific areas, and thus these apartments are excluded from the free market pricing. However, other rentals are negatively affected as a result, since the price of some rentals is artificially reduced, thus there is excess demand for the rentals, the free market must balance this error by increasing the costs of rentals that are subject to market prices, meaning that the landlords have to increase the rent on their tenants to stay profitable. Thus, the rent controls lead to shortages for rentals, but also increase to, increases the price of rent that are not subjected to rent controls. To conclude this video, the market is a process of individuals pursuing their own self-interests, and the patterns and actions of individuals create market mechanisms that ensure that the consumers are always given full power over economic affairs. Any change in this delicate process, especially one from an external entity separate from the market process, can be catastrophic. If an individual concludes that the market is not self-regulating, meaning that an entity needs to establish rules and restrictions on it, how much of the market should the government control? A little? A lot? The entirety of it? The inevitable result of putting power in the hands of the central planners rather than in the consumers is the destruction of natural market processes and mechanisms like supply and demand, profits and losses, and market prices, essential for our economy. If the entirety of the market, and thus all private property, is controlled by the government and central planners or converted into public or common property, that is socialism. Socialism is effectively the system of these issues I just described. Shortages, surpluses, a lack of incentives, and a monopoly providing goods and services. The state. Thus, it is necessary to conclude that the market is self-regulating. The regulation occurs from consumer demand. Thank you for watching this video. Goodbye, and enjoy the rest of your day.